Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Mark Gibson, Reed Fishler, and Larry Bailey. Coming up on DTNS, should you trust Anchor's Eufy cameras? We'll explain. The EU is going to let 5G onto airplanes and why I believe the children are the metaverse. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 2nd, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You know, a lot of people think we're too Ohio-centric, but Roger and I are here to balance it out. So, you know, it's... Uh... I'll fight you. <laughs> Pull over here. You guys Pull over know here. Ohio is awesome. <laughs> uh, I used to vacation in Ohio as a young yeah. lad. There uh, you go. So, yeah, I, I agree. Ohio is, is pretty great. Uh, Sarah Lane's out today, but we have got a great show. So let's start with the quick hits. Thursday, around 2 a.m., a man traveling by snow machine in northwest Alaska, it wasn't Amos, he was in New York, activated his Apple iPhone Emergency SOS. The Apple Emergency Response Center and the Northwest, Northwest Arctic Borough Search and Rescue Coordinator worked together with Alaska State Troopers and local volunteer search and rescue teams, who did a lot of the local work, to locate the man using the GPS coordinates provided by Apple. The man was found and brought to Kutzebue. No injuries were reported, and it's the first reported use of Apple's emergency SOS feature for rescue purposes. Google announced it will start rolling out end-to-end -end encrypted RCS group chats to the Google Messages beta over the next few weeks. Previously, only one-on-one -on -one RCS chats were end-to-end -end encrypted. RCS is the successor standard to SMS, which is supported by Android and most major phone carriers. It is not supported yet by Apple. Uh, yeah. I wonder if anyone's talked to them about that. You know, I think maybe. Yeah. Another day, another game mastered by an algorithm. Researchers at Alphabet's DeepMind published a paper in the journal Science detailing Deep Nash. That is the name of an algorithm that can best human players at Stratego. Uh, because a player cannot see what type of pieces an opponent has in Stratego, it's a much more incomplete information problem than, say, something like Texas Hold'em Poker. Researchers trained Deep Nash with reinforcement learning, playing 5.5 billion games against itself. Uh, it's designed to find Nash equilibrium. If you ever watched A Beautiful Mind, you, you might have heard that. Uh, and a set of strategies such that no player benefits by changing strategy on their own. After 50 matches on the game platform project Gravon, Deep Nash now ranks third among all players since 2002. The payment processing company Stripe announced it's launching its own fiat to crypto on-ramp widget, which will let customers easily exchange dollars for cryptocurrency. Stripe will handle fraud, compliance, and know your customer checks as part of the transaction. These kinds of widgets are often used by cryptocurrency companies offering dApps and NFTs so that customers can use their preferred currency without involving a cryptocurrency exchange. <laughs> you know, like FTX. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, Privacy-focused Brave Software announced it has begun its test of privacy-preserving ads in its search engine. So Brave uses the content of your search query, what you typed in, the country the request appears to be coming from, I'm guessing by IP address, and then the device type. Is it a laptop? Is it an iPhone? Etc. And they use those three types of information to determine what ad to show you. None of that information is stored. They don't build a profile. They just look at those three pieces of information, pick an ad, show it to you, and then throw it all away. Uh, if you don't even want that amount of tracking and you don't want to see any ads, Brave Premium is now available for $3 a month. All right. Let's talk about the future of being annoyed on airplanes. <laughs> the BBC reports that the European Commission can provide 5G service aboard airplanes. The EU has reserved certain frequencies for airplane service since 2008. Member states have until June 30th to make the frequency bands available for in-flight 5G service. The EU uses different 5G frequencies than the U.S. and at lower power, so they don't have the concerns that the 5G interfering systems um, like RADALT have uh, with U.S. carriers. Once those frequency bands are made available, flyers in service areas would not need to put phones in airplane mode. So, Tom, does this mean that we'll be subject to planes full of loud phone calls? Uh, in Europe, 
Possibly. Uh, I my hope, my my thought, my expectation even uh, might be that while five G on the plane is going to allow you to not have to put it in airplane mode, you'll be able to just keep you know uh, saying funny things on Twitter as you're waiting to take off all the way into the air. Uh, that you will have policies put in place by the airlines about what you can do on those uh, that that would not disturb your neighbor. I would imagine some airlines might just say like, hey, you can use 5G all day long on your phone. You can stream your video, do whatever you want, but don't talk on the phone. Don't talk uh, Don't talk loudly on the phone and disturb the other passengers. I mean, do, do you think I'm naive to believe that? Well, Tom, I think it's going to be a combination of that and people actually talking on the phones. Because if you think about uh, big international flights, particularly in first class and business class, mm. those pods have phones in them. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you are already able to make phone calls on airplanes. You have been able to do this for quite some time. Um, it's ridiculous. Ridiculously expensive to do it. And I think that that's going to be the barrier for a lot of folks. They're just not going to pay uh, the price to have a, you know, a phone call in the air. Um, and then when you're thinking about, uh, you know, if this is just contained within the EU, uh, those flights, you know, in, in many cases aren't very long. So those aren't the flights where people are going to just be having long phone calls. At least I don't think most people would have long phone calls on those type of flights at the expense that they would probably have to incur to have them. I don't know, man. I, I've I've been on some flights where where folks just keep talking on the phone, and and the cabin door is closed, and the flight attendant is leaning over. I'm like, please wrap up your call. Uh, please wrap up your call. If they don't have to wrap up the call, right? If there's not a policy, uh, like a like a security policy, right now they can be like, you have to have that thing in airplane mode. If they don't have to do that. I feel like there's going to be some people take advantage and just talk from from the minute they're on the plane until landing. So, so th this is the question for me, though. Um, when you are using that in-flight 5G, is th that's that's a different bill, I think. I think you know. Well, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how this is going to work. It might cost more. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, right. how how are you going to be billed for that? Is that going to mm -hmm. be like a roaming charge uh, right. that you you would get? I, I would imagine that it would because I don't see airplanes or air, you know airlines doing this because they don't think they can make money from it. I mean, I think that this is something that. We, you know, we, we can service our customers and sure. give them something that they want. And we can also build them ridiculously for it as <laughs> yeah. we service them. No, you're right. It'll it'll be a charge. There'll, there'll be certain carriers like T-Mobile right now. If you fly on Delta, you don't have to pay for your Wi-Fi, right? There'll be certain mm -hmm. carriers will be like, oh, if you're on our carrier, you don't have to pay. But they may limit what you can do on it. They may not. They may not route phone calls from from an airplane, mm -hmm. uh, and that would just take care of it right there. Uh, Stealth Dave points out nobody talks on the phone anymore anyway, so maybe we'll just age out of that because you know the, the younger you get, the less likely you are to not just text someone or or send a meme instead of calling them. So, uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe there's hope. Maybe the children are our future, is what I'm trying to say. And the other thing too, I, I remember, uh, and this is back in like the BlackBerry and Palm Pilot days, people would freak out when you would even use your phone on a plane, let oh, alone yeah. be connected to data. And over time, we just kind of get used to it to where it is just a thing. Like you said, with T-Mobile, you can just, you know, you just hop on a plane and you still have data. You can't make phone calls, but you still have data. I think this may just be an extenuation of that, that over time, people will simply just get used to it. Because I think about trains. People mm -hmm, talk on the phone mm -hmm. all the time on yeah. trains and it's not terribly disruptive. I mean, you, you know, you will have a time or two where the porter has to go say, Hey, can you quiet down? Right. But you already have that on plane. So yeah. I don't really see this being a big issue. No, I think you talked me down. Uh, social norms will develop where, yes, will you have the person who talks too loud? Sure. And then the flight attendant will come over and ask them to, you know, please keep it down. Just like you would if somebody was talking to the other person in the seat next to them too loud and disturbing other passengers. So, right. all right. All right. Overall, I think it's a good thing though. I, I, I don't want that to get lost. I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to just have 5g service and use everything on my phone the way I normally would without having to switch over to Wi-Fi and some things work and some things don't. And I won't be able to get it until we're 10,000 feet in the air. Like that's it's all good stuff to me. Right. That it's, I think it's a good trade off. Yeah. Uh, Wall Street Journal's Sarah E. Needleman and Sarah Donaldson wrote an article called Kids Don't Want Money Anymore. Virtual currencies have become many families' preferred way to pay allowance. Can you convert this to Robux? 
<laughs> now, uh, that's that's the sub- title and the subtitle. It starts with an anecdote about parents paying kids an allowance for doing chores, and then the kids handing it right back and asking them to convert it to Robux. Uh, there's some other anecdotes talking about the freedom kids have to buy virtual items. Uh, one example being a virtual Louis Vuitton purse using Robux and without needing the parents to drive them to a store to do it. But Tom, before you get outraged, virtual items are way less expensive than real uh, life counterparts. That Louis Vuitton purse costs less than $5. And games like Roblox have strong parental controls that help prevent out of control spending. Parents can down, uh, excuse me, parents can control the money supply just like they would with a cash allowance. And kids still get lessons in how to spend wisely. Yeah. So it won't cost your kids a lot, in the words of Jesse, to look good in your Louis Louis. Um, That's good to know. But There's a lot of children doing this. About half of Roblox's 60 million daily users are under the age of 13. Uh, There's also a lot of money for this. Uh, Roblox revenues have grown 600% in the past three years to $1.9 billion last year. You don't hear about Roblox laying off a bunch of people. Uh, It also makes almost all that money off of selling Robux. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of other, certainly not anything close to bringing in as much money as Robux does. And Roblox isn't the only one doing this. Minecraft has mine coins. Fortnite has V-Bucks. Pokemon Go has Poke coins. Uh, there's even a company called Moonbug that sells NFTs of kids show characters from Coco Melon and Blippi. Uh, last year, children 12 to 17 spent an average of $92 a month online. That's twice as much as they did two years earlier. Rob, I know your kids are grown now. Uh, how do you think you would deal this with this if you still had youngins? Um, no differently than how I dealt with it when I had youngins, because the, the story is about Roblox and it's about, you know, kids wanting virtual currency to do things inside of these games. But when it comes to allowance, number one, most kids, when they first start getting it, they don't understand the concept and the value of money. They just want things. They just want stuff. And in this case, if they're playing this game and, you know, I think a lot of them got into it because they were kind of captive audience inside all the time over the pandemic, then, oh, there's stuff in that game. I want it. So it's not about I want my allowance in this way. It's just that I want stuff in that game. And if my allowance allows me to get it, then so be it. So I don't see this as being any different than if your kids are into go-kart racing, they want to use their uh, allowance on go-kart parts. If they are into pogo sticks, they want to use their allowance on pogo sticks. I think it's just whatever your children are into, that's what they want to use their allowance on. Yeah. Kids want stuff, right? Like yeah. uh, sometimes it's real stuff. Sometimes uh, these days it's it's virtual stuff. Roger, you've got youngins. You know, yes. What do you think and- of this? Honestly, when I first heard about it, this really reminded me of what they used to do when I went to back in the olden days in school. Uh, when we used to sell magazines, we would we would collect not money, but we would collect uh, prize points. And then when you got a certain amount, you could you could spend them on a specific thing, whether it was like a little radio or like a cassette tape album of whatever band you wanted to listen to. It's just a way of. Uh, of of uh, of taking uh, uh, a, a, a sort of value uh, uh, toward an object, whether it's in game or whatever, and then making it so that it's just one step away from an actual, you know, actual money. I think we'll see a lot more of this because I mean they've been doing this with for kids in some way or fashion for the past forty years. Whether it's mm-hmm. you collect certain stickers, you collect coupons, you collect something that builds up in value that you then exchange for whatever the store yeah. offers. Bazooka Joe comics from the bubble gum that you sent in. And, I mean, you know. they do it for adults when they used to let you. S- Use your points to buy things from yeah. the credit card store. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like buy Absolutely. yourself a GPS. I mean, device. they still That's do what that. I did. That's not a new. Yeah. That's not a gone thing. Yeah, I'm thinking of Ralphie and all the stuff he had to save <laughs> up to get the decoder ring from Ovaltine. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, in, in a Christmas story. You said, you know, you said 40 years. This has been going on since advertising has existed. Yeah. Uh, and children were the target of it. So, so that that makes me think that the point of the story may be a little bit off. The the fact that kids want virtual items is just this is the latest thing that kids want and and right. what what the allowance is is 
going to let them understand how to allocate resources. If those resources are in game, I don't think there's any problem with that. You just need the parents to understand what's going on in Roblox, right? So there's a little learning curve there. There are also, I think, some fair concerns about things like blind boxes and 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 su such like uh, in games. I think Roblox is really good about managing. Uh, Fortnite has gotten better about managing. So you have to be careful what platform the kids are on. But the real popular ones like Minecraft and Roblox are, are pretty responsible with that stuff so to my my way of thinking the the article here is pointing out more to me that the children are already in the metaverse if ever if anyone wants to know what the metaverse is going to be look at the 12 to 17 year olds they're living in it they're going to grow up in it they're going to change it as they become adults they already kind of are as some of them have entered their 20s and uh Nobody's going to build a metaverse. Uh, the the children are already living in it, and it's just going to evolve from there. I, that that's what this tells me. No, I, th I think that's a, a a really good point. And I know, like, in lately in the news, everybody has been on Mark Zuckerberg about you really missed with the metaverse, and it's like, no, he's just really early. Um, well, he's got to let these kids grow up who are actively going to be the ones yeah. using it and kind of driving where the technology goes. And it's going to be very, very consumer driven. Like because what what I noticed is that the kid, the parents are connected to it through their kids' spending, right? By 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 engaging and managing what they what they can spend. And I think actually this is the one thing I thought was really cool. Before your parents, they might know what you were spending your coupon bucks on or whatever, but now you know, right? There, there's kind of the, the parental handle. controls. And yeah, all exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so. I think there there should be a little less resistance to it because parents do have kind of a say. They they have a throttle control on how, where the spending is and where it goes. Yeah, Stoic Squirrel is asking if the kids are using VR or are we using a broad meaning of metaverse? Uh, I I've always thought the connection between VR and metaverse is is just tangential. Uh, you you can have a metaverse without VR, and there's plenty of VR that's not metaverse. Uh, they may or may not interact. We're we're talking about the metaverse in the sense of a virtual world that they live in and value and want to spend five dollars on a Louis Vuitton virtual person. Right. Uh, if they access it by VR, great. AR, great. Phone, whatever. Like it's still the virtual landscape that they're treating as real. And if Meta wants to build the metaverse, they better start getting 15, 16, 17 year olds into whatever they think that's going to be. And Facebook is not it. Well, they, they they better allow you to take that Louis Vuitton bag that you bought with Roblox, Robux and uh, move it to another part of the metaverse. That If, if we're really going to get a broad metaverse, uh, we're going to have to start yeah. seeing that. That's the next thing to look for is like, you know, Minecraft and, and Roblox come into some agreement where you can you can move things back and forth. I'm not saying that's going to happen anytime soon, but if you start to see, talk about that. Metaverse Federation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Fediverse. Wait, we already took that. Mastodon has that. Never mind. Uh, hey, folks, if you have a thought about this, if you're like, hey, that sparks a thought, I wonder if it could be this, send it to us. Email it. We want your email. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Anchor offers cameras under the Eufy brand. Eufy cameras promise that all recorded footage is encrypted on device and sits straight to your phone. And only you have the key to decrypt and watch the footage, a.k.a. in and encrypted. The company cites ISO 27001 and ISO 27701 certification from the British Standards Institute for Information Security Management and Privacy Information Management. So it was a little surprising, given Anchor's good reputation and all of this due diligence they've done to get certified, get independently audited, when security researcher Paul Moore claimed that Eufy cameras stored faces without encryption and streamed video without authentication. Moore's statement was followed by SEC Consult, publishing a summary of two years of their research, showing that thumbnails of recorded Eufy images were transferred to an AWS instance. Eufy responded by saying, yes, those thumbnails are transferred. They are restricted by account logins, and the URLs for the thumbnails expire after 24 hours, unless you share them somewhere. They clarified to Ars Technica that the thumbnails are only sent off device if you choose mobile push notification images, uh, you don't have to do that. You can choose text notifications, but if you choose image notification, they have to get them to you, and that's how they get them to you, and they are server-side encrypted. 
Eufy has updated its setup language to make that clear. They said, yep, our setup language could have been better. They've already updated that. Uh, if you choose image-based notifications, which you don't have to, those images will need to leave your local drive and briefly be hosted in the cloud. So that one kind of makes sense. And they've addressed what I think was the problem, which is the unclear language and setup. But there's more. Yeah, but Moore also claimed that he found that he could remotely start and monitor Eufy cameras through VLC without authentication or encryption. He said he couldn't release a proof of concept, but another security researcher called Wasabi said that he had posted about the problem and worked with The Verge to demonstrate the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Now, The Verge says there were two ways that they used to get that URL that you would need in order to monitor a camera that wasn't yours. The first way you would need to log in with the username and password that was in control of that camera, which, I mean, you could fish that, hack it, whatever. Uh, and then there was an undisclosed technique to get the URL. So it wasn't easy to get to. You had to know how to get it, but you could get it, and that would show a camera stream. Eufy has since made that technique not work. The Verge says we can't make that work anymore. They did a change in the website, so you can't even, even if you get into somebody's account, you can't get that URL. However, the URL included the camera's serial number in Base64, which you could just uncalculate. If you found the serial number, you could calculate Base64 version of it. A Unix timestamp, that's easy. A token and a four-digit random hex. Now, it's possible for someone to recreate that URL without having to go into your account. They would have to have the serial number of the camera. Uh, that might be harder to get. They'd either have to get physical access to your camera, trick you into telling them it somehow, but they'd have to get that. So there's some effort involved there. They would have to brute force the hex number, but it's only four digits, so that's fairly easy. The Verge said also it did not appear the token in the URL was validated. They were able to just change it to whatever they wanted, and the URL still worked. Thankfully, Eufy serial numbers are long, complex, and non-sequential, so they're not easy to guess. It would probably take some social engineering to get it. The Verge also said that these only work if the camera's already awake. An anchor denies that there is a problem. It told The Verge and ARS Technica that it is not possible to start and monitor a stream and watch live footage from a Eufy camera without a third-party player like VLC. And it told ARS Technica that it disagrees with the accusations and encourages customers to contact customer support if they have concerns. Still, Android Central has removed all of its recommendations for Eufy cameras. I think the, the, the thumbnail image was a misunderstanding. They fixed it. That one doesn't bother me. I think this vulnerability is probably not going to affect 99% or more of Eufy users. If you're a high value target, you probably shouldn't be using Eufy cameras uh, in this way anyway. What bugs me, and I, I know what's going on here, which is Anchor is saying, yeah, we know this is a possible vulnerability, but virtually no one's gonna take advantage of it. Uh, it's really difficult for someone to use, so we're not worried about it. Why should we spend time and money fixing it? Uh, however, they wouldn't have to spend a whole lot of time and money uh, to repair their customer relationship if they just validated that token or explain why that token can't or shouldn't be validated. But just saying this isn't a problem, I don't think is going to wash at this point. Yeah, so like, like you said, this is not going to affect very, very many people, but it could affect some. And the fixed, it will cost Anchor something. I think that something is less than the PR hit that they're taking if they just are nonchalant. It's not a big deal. We're not going to worry about it because people are going to say how oh, I can go buy the you know, anchor is it's a big brand, but it's not the only brand. There are other, there are other cameras out there that do similar functions to this. So um, they've got to be real careful in, in how they walk this line. And I wouldn't be shocked if they come back and they decide, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and, uh, you know, authenticate these tokens. Yeah. And, and again, I don't, I don't think it should be lost on folks. How much effort it would be if, if I wanted to spy on Rob, I'd have to trick him into giving me the serial number or sneak into his house and copy the serial number down or hack into a computer where the serial number was stored. Like it would take effort. This is, this is not an easy hack. Uh, and I feel like anchor could just make it go away by validating that token. Maybe I'm overlooking something there, but if that token in the URL was validated uh, and you couldn't guess it, 
right? Right now, it doesn't. you don't even have to guess it. You just put something else in that space in the URL and it works. All you need is that serial number uh, and then brute force the hex number. Maybe make that hex number long, longer too to provide a little extra security. In fact, making that hex number a whole lot longer would just reduce this possibility so, clo- so much closer to zero. That might be enough. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, it, it seems to me that... Yes, they're not wrong. This is a very low probability thing, but now that it's out there and people react into it, a little bit of effort to address it probably would go a long way. This is not one of those times where any publicity is good publicity. No. This is <laughs> you you know, Acre needs to, you know, they need to get in front of this and the fix, although it will cost them something, will be less costly than the lack of sales yeah. of these devices if they right. don't fix it. All right, folks, uh, we know flight delays and cancellations are a frustrating price to pay for traveling, and we know a lot of you are traveling, sometimes for the first time in a couple of years these days. But Chris Christensen is here with a tip that might just help ease that burden. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. There's a new resource that's come out for U.S. domestic carriers from the U.S. Department of Transportation called the Airline Customer Service Dashboard. And what it shows you is by airline, by carrier, what kind of opportunities will you have if there are cancellations or controllable delays? And so will they, for instance, rebook you on a partner airline? Will they give you a meal, cash? Will they give you complimentary hotel accommodations if they cancel your flight? So so check that out. The easiest way to find it is to Google airline customer service dashboard. I would take it with a grain of salt because I know that I've twice been stranded this year and by one of the airlines who I shan't call out JetBlue and <laughs> they did not offer me any hotel credits and they did not do what this document says that they would do. Mm. Take it with a grain of salt, but it's a useful resource. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I think what Chris is trying to say, Rob, is your frequent flyer mileage may vary. He said they're very eloquent. <laughs> he didn't uh, call any companies out, <clears throat> except for one. Except for the one that yeah, it sounded one. like he sneezed to me. Yeah, Do it, uh, yeah I don't know. You're, are you traveling? Let me, let me you, gonna... yeah, you, you know what? That, that was a sneeze. That was a sneeze. Yeah, that was a uh, bless, bless you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Chris Christmas. All right, let's check out the mailbag. So this message comes from Jason Pilato, where he says, the other day, my slack blew up on me. It's vital to my work. Turns out it was because I use 1.1.1.1. That's, uh, I believe, that's Cloudflare. Mm. Uh, changing over to OpenDNS fixed the issue. I was wondering, do the DTNS team use a specific DNS or stick with the default one through their ISP? I know for me, I use the Google one. What is that? Uh, you know, 8.8.8.8.8.8. Mm-hmm. Um, so I use that. I've used Cloudflare before. Um, my gut tells me that this is not a Cloudflare issue. It's just a Cloudflare may have had an issue at the time. That he, you know, that, that he, yeah, yeah, they're, no. they're, they're pretty reliable usually. Yeah, I'm sure if Jason switched back to 1.1.1.1, uh, Slack would work fine. I also understand that moment where you're like, I need Slack to work right now, and I'm not going to wait for them to fix it. I'm switching <laughs> to open DNS. I, right. I get that. I use 1.1.1.1, and I had forgotten, I had to go look it up because I'd forgotten what I had put in there. Uh, and I have not had issues with that. So you're, yeah, uh, it's another, your mileage may vary, uh, situation, but, um, yeah, I think most of us here, actually, I think it was Roger, were you saying you use 8.8.8.8.8? I think, I think he was saying that. Right? Yeah. I use the, uh, Google, I used to use open DNS, but, uh, I found Google just to have less issues over like an eight year period. So if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, you can go into your network settings, uh, either on your computer or sometimes in your router, uh, people do it, uh, and say, when you're looking up a domain domain name, don't go to my ISP to look it up. Uh, go to this address to look it up. And one of the reasons you might want to do that is uh, because ISPs sometimes track and monetize that information. Uh, other times people are like, you know what? I I just want a more reliable domain name system, one that's putting in all the latest DNS sec and security uh, things. Uh, it's not something you have to do, but a lot of people do it just as one more step towards being secure. And they're easy to remember. All ones, all eights. Yeah, yeah. They're just easy to remember. Indeed. All right. Uh, Len Peralta has been busily illustrating today's show. And uh, Len, I'm very curious to find out what you drew for us today. You know, I'm just getting old. I, I you know, we were talking about the story about the Robux and, mm-hmm. you know, I have a young child 
uh, you know, ten year old, eleven year old son uh, who hasn't got into it yet, but it's scaring me. Anyway, thinking, talking about this uh, brought up like you know the next wave. Uh, you know, Rob talked about uh, uh, the metaverse being a little bit too premature. Mm -hmm. But hey, why can't we? Why can't we do something fun like this? This is a uh, an image of a TV show that's coming out. I would say probably January one called Meet the Rebillionaires, <laughs> and uh, you know I can just see these. You know, it, it's it's about two fun-loving kids or a group of fun-loving kids mm. who are spending their Robux and in in fun ways and and taking over the world. Yeah, they're... they've got their 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 virtual Balenciagas and tuxedos. <laughs> oh and, man, yeah, uh, maybe maybe not the Balenciagas, but the uh, <laughs> but the Louis Vuittons for sure. Um, yeah, uh, if you if you want to take a look at this, if you want to actually uh, get this print, you can go. To my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, where if you become a, a backer, you automatically get this print. Or you can go the the uh, traditional way and go to my online store and get it there. Which, by the way, I am uh, selling uh, my custom-drawn holiday cards. Uh, and uh, I've got a, an open commission line. So uh, so hit me up and uh, and 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 get you know celebrate the holidays. There's there's me. three levels. You could have three levels of Len in your holiday. Uh, if you're <laughs> if you're a DTNS patron, uh, you may have already got your holiday card drawn by Len. You can also go to our store and buy holiday cards designed by Len. But the best way to do it is to go to Len yourself and say, right draw right. exactly what I want for the holidays <laughs> on this card. Uh, I so, love yeah. the three levels of Len. That's yeah. like a, it's not quite Dante's Inferno, but it's close. <laughs> it it gets you out of Dante's Inferno. <laughs> exactly correct. Uh, yeah. Don't let your holidays turn into Dante's Inferno. No, no. That's, yeah. that's probably good advice for everybody. So. And, and, and so that's uh, LenPeraltaStore.com? LenPeraltaStore.com. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, also, thanks to our brand new boss, Petey, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Petey. Yay. Uh, Petey gets it. Petey's, it's a wave. I would call it a Patreon wave sweeping across the nation that Petey is the leading edge of right now. You could be you tomorrow. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show. We are going to continue along with the uh, the, the folks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to find. Uh, I, I changed my soundboard around and now I can't find anything. All right. Here we go. Um, we are going to uh, stick around and we're going to talk some more. So if you're a patron, you're going to get that. You can also watch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday, talking about what we can do about our imperfect understanding of AI with Andrea Jones-Roy. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, WS Goddess One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gutterama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's shows included Nicole Lee, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Rob Dunwood, and Chris Christensen. Our guests this week included Bodie Grimm and Jim Thatcher. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>